Hi, I'm Seamless, and today I'm going to show you how to make this sound. Lots of fun stuff in there. So, uh, the basic rundown of this is that I create a sound inside Serum, and that is getting output um, into the modular stuff back into the channel, back out of the channel. There's lots of in and outs going on here. Um, and this is going to be more or less showing out, showing off how all that works. Um, so, but like this recording we're looking at, the reason why there's samples here, despite this being here, which totally does work, is because um, normally I would give you presets, right? I give you presets or projects or whatever, and I can still give you the project, but since you don't have the hardware, that would not really make any sense. So what I did is I recorded three passes of uh, manual automation because part of what making making the actual sound work is the fact that like th this parameter, this parameter, and that parameter, I'm moving with my hands uh, while I'm doing it, and so I just I just looped this three times and made the motions, and that's why there's three different sets of it. So this is 136 samples, 138 samples, a whole bunch of samples, and I'm just gonna let you guys have those for free, um, just because that's uh, that seems like the only really like uh, value that this could this particular video could have insofar as getting an actual result. But I also particularly think myself, uh, in my own opinion, that this is kind of interesting. I hope you agree. Otherwise, why are you watching this video? Jeez. Anyway, let's go from the beginning. Uh, there's noise everywhere. So, this is what the serum sounds like by itself. <laughs> when also pan to the right, rather, the left. So, the whole point of the panning is that when you output into the, the ADAT channels, they're, they are out, they are specifically stereo pairs. So, in order to get, and an, in the ES3, let's go back over there. In order to get... Um, the output of one and two here. So like this this output one is the audio, but its output two is actually uh, it's it's audio that's being routed into CV into the bit razor. Um, that's what uh, this first. Um, if I can open up channel rec. Oh yeah, that's right. Detached burp. That's what this first citrus is for. It's going out um, uh, eight at one and two here, but this is panned all the way to the right. Undetach you, please. Thank you. It's panned all the way to the right so that it's going out that channel versus the other guy going out the other channel. This gets us uh, efficient use of our outs. So that sound that we're hearing right now is like just a super basic kind of like FME kind of thing. I didn't go that deep with this. Um, and this is because if I'm going to merge, if I'm going to merge digital stuff with like, like in the box stuff with out of the box stuff, because really like a lot of this is digital. This is a digital module, the bit, the bit razor, of course it is bit crushing i mean whatever anyway um digital things have a have particular strengths that the sort of analog stuff does not and in a lot of ways that's fm that's uh, particular kinds of modulation uh you could do fm and stuff like that in, in the analog stuff but it's a little bit harder to handle the digital things and so digital sounds especially things that you could do with serum um are way easier to recall. like even this basicness would be kind of hard to do this clean with analog stuff because that's apparently a strength of the digital world is its cleanliness. I'm not even compressing it. It's just on there. So uh, this is a table. It's, um, I forget what folder it's in, probably in digital or isn't in analog, but it's a, a kind of, it's a very light sound. And then I'm AMing it by this other, this other waveform here, but I am AMing it an octave higher. So it's getting us, it's keeping it square versus if it were not like that you get you get the bite of the look right of, uh, of having the whole uh four year series versus just having the square series also being a filter the filter is helping you know but it's not a big difference from like what was already going on that's just adding a slight modulation to those particular frequencies so that gets put out into uh the bit razor it's going out into 8.1 and 2 bam which is coming out of this guy going into senior bit razor uh, back to FL for a second, because now we have to go look at the first return. Analog 12, which is in the front of my interface over here, is what's accepting the bit raiser's input. And this is what that sounds like by itself, which I'm going to turn down from here, because I don't want to screw with the level here. I shall also go back. Yeah. That's loud enough. Okay, so... Now it's actually like what's going on with the bit razor is doing, is doing its thing. So what is the bit razor doing? So the bit razor 
is a bit crusher. It has a built-in filter, and it has the usual sort of bit crushing like a built like sound, right? Except that it has FM inputs, CV inputs for both of these parameters. So the main thing of what's happening that's really cool about all this is the fact that the 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 sample rate of the bit crusher is like if I wasn't doing this and I were just letting it go, letting it go. Yeah, cool. You get you get like what you expect from a particular a typical uh, bit crusher. And a regular filter. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna FM that parameter. So it's being at the FM according to that second uh, citrus that we we're talking about before. Which let's go look at that waveform again because I about particularly remember. Do 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 do. Oh yeah, that's right. So. Um, there's two things happening here. There's this this waveform, and then there's this. What is this idea here? So what you do to get this is you make a square, and then you you turn on uh, half mode, and this gets us a flattened straight level, otherwise known as a, a DC offset. Um, unlike an oscillation, this doesn't go up and down; it just stays at a level. And this is handy because what we're doing essentially is that I'm using uh, key uh, key mapping, which is to say that like when when it plays higher notes, it, it plays a higher value of this signal, and it starts at nothing, which means this signal is a flat line at the bottom, and it, it's essentially adding together with this waveform, which this whole waveform uh, is a sort of an interesting design because like I, a lot of what I listen to for modulation when I'm using digital things. Like digital FM with waveforms here do not apply to what you do in, in the analog stuff, um, because the analog stuff, or at least the hardware stuff, because again, not really all all these are analog. Um, you're it's it's one to one. You're basically interpreting this waveform that we built here as being an LFO applied to that parameter at the speed that is just the note which is the totally bonkers baller thing about all of this. There, it's getting better that you can do this in digital things now, like re the reactor blocks, which are modeled after this, this entire environment, um, reactor six blocks, rather, is you know a, a big step in the right direction. So the value of this is that essentially this is modulating it, and then when it adds together with this signal uh, as a result of the keyboard mapping, it essentially is able to move the center of where the modulation is up. Or you know, according to the pitch. So this means that like we don't like because a big problem with bit crushing is that when you're using it, you get that ring of wherever the primary uh, like position of the frequency. That ring is it can get really obnoxious. So when you're playing different notes and, you, and, and it moves it up and down, it makes it feel a little less static, which is important for my tastes. Anyway, what I had just done there was I plugged in. The, that particular waveform into this particular parameter. Now this parameter allows us essentially to attenuate this signal, so how much this is essentially an envelope uh, map amount to this parameter. Again, with this... Let's play a higher note than that. Nice. See, if it goes too far, then it goes below, and it goes down to where it doesn't so sound good anymore. So if, if like right here, like we like this tone as a center, but we want to add FM to it, you have a hard time because it would go below it as much as above it, which means that it would go into the range where it's not static. It's not like notable, <laughs> notable. It doesn't sound like a note anymore. So you have to go higher when you have more FM. And of course, different positions sound better differently. And like oh, the big, uh, like what I mentioned earlier about like doing this manually is that when I'm playing it, I'm moving not only this guy but also this filter. And this filter helps to kind of bring together the note because again, it's the same modulation going into the the bit crusher, but it's on top now. Of, uh, it's essentially like it's like capping off the signal on the the high frequencies. <laughs> And it immediately introduces that nice sort of squelchy tone, which for these kinds of sounds is important. Anyway, this signal is going back into FL where it's getting like compressed and stuff. Actually, let's listen to what this sounds like without the EQ compression. So this is the raw of that sound. Plus the sub that's coming out on the other side. That is what that signal sounds like. And then it gets compressed. And this is just a big, a big just like up up job like i really just wanted to bring it all up did i just turn it off there it is. 
no compression on the master because I, I, I'm not seeking to limit it at this point. I, I still want the dynamics in play for the further processing that I do when I go back inside, which is what I do. Because now, um, three and four, and that is EQ. Oh, yeah, that's right. The band pass filter. Derp. There's a band pass filter going on. And that's what this automation clip is. The second guy down here. This first guy up here is... Uh, the, I think the wavetable position... Oh, it's just the macro on zero, which is like the filter and I think some wavetable stuff. I macro all this stuff together. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. I probably should have mentioned that while I was there. Good job, me. Uh, yeah, and initially I was also going to do things like automate this to like move it. Because if you think it, there's, there's definitely a way to get the signals to add together and such that it should be able to mimic what it's like when I'm manually moving the parameter as well as being modulated. Just that I haven't quite done the experiments or know the math necessary to just know what that is. Um... But I've done it successfully before. I just didn't keep it up this time. Anyway, uh, put this back on. So now it's going at three or four, but just the left side there. And then it's coming out. And it's coming out again, this dude here, which is going into the herb verb. The herb verb. Now, this is like one of the cooler things about all of this stuff is that things like this exist, which is this is a this is a this is a reverb unit. Which, among other things, it, it, it's just a really good reverb unit. But all of the parameters have CV control, including things like the size of the thing itself. And that's where this last modulation coming out of the channel 4 of the expert sleepers is, is. It is this other serum, which is this very slight kind of sawway looking thing. The thing about, the thing about sawway is, and the thing about moving around the, the, the reverb is that not every parameter is created equal equal in terms of how fast it can move and, and how accurately it can it mimic whatever shape you throw at it. Not everything will get you the perfectly sharp, like, a analog filter kind of Christmas when you throw a saw wave into, like, a high-resonance uh, cutoff filter. Cutoff of a filter, of a low-pass filter. All these words I'm trying to say. But things like th sometimes things like the Wii Reverb don't necessarily do such a, good, such a good job. I just stammered hard on all those words. Wow, man. <clears throat> anyway, uh... Looking back up there for a second, because I want to make sure it works. <laughs> yeah, so I turned the sub off again, just so that we know what it sounds like. Uh, but I'm also going to turn the effects off of the return, so that we hear what the verb does. Yeah. Now, I have it all the way on ret, on ret, yeah, on the wet side, which normally you probably wouldn't do. But all the sort of weirdness that the filter, the, the filters and whatnot of the reverb do, does is way more exemplified when it's all the way on. If you've ever messed with like a reverb's time parameter, like when a particular plugin lets you, it might not always let you do it while you're running it or render it right or whatever, but you could sometimes hear things do that and move around and like this is letting you essentially in real time mess with that parameter. And in this case, I'm FMing it by that saw waveform. So... These cables you see me using are called stack cables. Uh, they're made by a company called Tip Top, and the way they work is that they plug in, and like you know, on both ends they have another uh, input on top of that input, and this is really for outputs. So if I like I'm over here, it's coming out of this parameter, but I can still keep going out to something else without having to use something like a mult, like these guys, which exist purely to copy and clone signals for this exact purpose. Um, it's also, this is sort of a different use of it, where it's going in through this thing, but then coming into it, and then going into another. In this case, this is the tilt parameter. This parameter is, I'm pretty sure, just a very vague, like, bandpass lean on things. It's essentially a dark, a light dark filter, like it's dark on the bottom, light on top, and I'm FMing it. So we get, which is handy, because the reverb can get real cloudy. And if you're FMing something like tilt, no matter how sort of diffused it gets you're able to sort of come back with a note that you can you can sort of tell from it so what you just saw me do in there was what i was doing during those three passes i made i made all the stuff and i am automating um stuff going on in the real in the real world huh? the digital world the exact opposite of the real world but out here automation is my hands and you know whatever else i want to have going on i could use other oscillators and lfos and that kind of thing but i wanted to be in more control of what i was doing for that specific purpose that kind of thing and again like i said before i could have come up with much better signal mixing like you can use you can use vcas to add together cv just as well as audio because it is all just audio so i could have uh served a, a better solution to modulating these parameters but like reliably and repeatably 
by getting single, singles to do what they want. Uh, I have more stuff going on over here, but like all of this is actually just something completely different that has nothing to do with the sound. In fact, I should probably, if I wanted to, I can get rid of everything that's not uh, currently involved in this. Uh, yeah. Okay. All of these guys. So this is this is actually what I was using to make um, that that signal, that bass. So back into FL with this guy. Uh, once it comes back in, I, I put a convolver on it, and this is a neat impulse that's already in FL. This is called um, Room Presence. It's in the uh, devices, uh, Room Devices amount, and this is great because it just gives us a nice, like, very short, essentially stereo field, and applied to things. It uh, did I kill it? Oh, it's not very loud because I haven't compressed it yet. Ah, you can kind of hear it coming out at the end there. How hard did I come down on the stereo on this? Pretty, pretty hard. That's why it, it can sometimes get a little overbearing. Um, but the purpose of it is that like it, it doesn't really add a reverb, reverb to it. Not unless I stretched it too far. Like I didn't stretch it that. I think I stretched it back a little bit actually. But if you stretch it far enough, eventually like this will be long enough in between each of these little events. Like you'll hear it as a delay, versus like a, just a really short reverb. But if you go too short, you get that kind of like tin can sort of um, problem. Anyway, uh, this is going back. Uh, into this thing here, but it's being added together with the sub. Now, this is uh, this is just a limiter and some and a final bit of EQ here. But like the problem with this thing, the, with this here, is that I am integrating a, a two different amounts of digital effects with also external audio routing coming in and out of my interface, which is fraught with delay when you're going in and out like this. And um, as a result, the so the sub is just like not in time with it, and rather than try to figure out um, the whole delay business, I actually just straight up separated the sub. It's um, it's on audio file, as you, and as you can see, like this this guy is actually a lot. This is where this is originally how much farther. This is this is the synth processing. This is the actual like uh, mid mid bass process. And that's how far away it was from the, the sub starting when it's supposed to start. Um, so I just manually moved everything back and uh, layered it together, and um, yeah. I could, do I, should I? Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. So my plan was gonna be, if you're ever interested in making sample packs uh, using FL, this is this is something that's particularly handy. Like, there's other programs that exist to do this job, which is to chop up um, every uh, this whole thing into individual files as opposed to one big file. Um, the way you do that is you make markers, essentially. Like, the way I have done it is I've, I made a, just a big crawl of notes here. And uh, so they're like, they begin. So like, here's D, right? I don't say D2 as the, as the B, like D the octave two. It's D and then the second one that's D and the third one that's D. So D1, D2, D3. That's usually how my nomenclature works. I don't I don't differentiate the octaves because I have found for me personally that I just do not care. I will determine what if it's good enough and right the right octave when I hear it. I don't need to be told what it is. Um, anyway... You make markers, and then you, when you render it out, you'll have a file that's labeled with all the markers, and you help, you put it into Edison, and then you render that out as a batch, and it'll cut it automatically um, on all of those on all of those marked lines and name them what they're named. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make like this thing here, right? This like this progression of notes, you know, chop this thing in half, layer it over, and then just render, I guess, six individual files, and I'm then going to batch out into all the individual stuff, and like. Before I would do things like have a notepad with copy and pasted like note uh, hierarchy with the, uh, another app I use that let me copy and paste uh, multiple titles and sequences and stuff like that because like this is the most obnoxious part about making a sample pack. It's the naming part, not the actual making the thing. Anyway, um, I hope this made sense and I hope this made sense. Like I hope this whole thing and this business made sense. Uh, let me know what you thought about it. If you have any questions about it, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all the good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.